Hey everyone, Reed here. Now first off, apologies for missing the other week. A lot of travel issues when I was over in Europe uh, related to getting around in France and everything in between conferences and the fact that I was also suffering from an illness, um, had a cold that I came down with. So apologies for that in advance. Um, with that being said, what I have done uh, in exchange is I've agreed to do a video for your user group specifically, where I will run through everything that I had done um, or was going to do in the initial presentation. I'll also give you a, an option to see a video and content that I have not actually released anywhere else yet. So we're going to start off with that today uh, to begin with. So we'll get a little bit of a sneak preview where you guys will get an exclusive of some content as well for things that just have not been released, which will eventually come out to my channel. And then the rest of the stuff will be part of my normal presentation, um, kind of as a way for me to make up for it a little bit. But otherwise, let's get started with kind of the overall presentation. I'll walk through the introduction, what we'll be going over, and then I will cover the content itself. So this talk is called Achievement Unlocked, Upgrading Your Visuals and Reports, and it's going to run through a lot of cool tips, tricks, and practices for upgrading report visuals and design. A little bit about myself. My name is Reed Havens. I've been in the BI space for about 10 years now. I do a lot of stuff related to reporting, design, and implementation, and I really love everything related to Power BI. I've also been gracious enough to be given an MVP status for about the last four or five, five years now that I've been going on with this, and a lot of that comes through the YouTube content and all the other things that I create online to present back to people like yourself and meetup groups such as this. So. Uh, that's a little bit about me. Um, I do enjoy visualization and design, as you can see. I've been gifted the nickname of the BizWiz or the Visualization Wizard, as some of my colleagues have affectionately named me. And it really, I think, showcases through, especially a lot of the stuff that I do on YouTube. Now, the talk itself covers a lot of different things. Now, for the purpose of this demonstration, I will try to cover as many of these as I can, given the hours time frame and the recording time that I have. Uh, but you'll see a lot of really interesting things today that will cover quite a few different things related um, to many items that you're actually able to uh, upgrade and um, enhance in your report design. So we'll get through as many of these as we can, but this will kind of give you an overview of everything we'll be going over. So with that said, let's actually hop into the first demo. So to start with, I'll mention the fact that uh, a couple of weeks ago, I did release a video on YouTube where I showed actually how to create the spark lines here related to the two different charts that we have for both win-loss dollar and win-loss percentage. So I'll start with those and then show you kind of the sneak peek of the video that I'll have up and coming, but you guys will get the first preview of. So the initial version of this visual, let's go ahead and duplicate this down here. I'm gonna shrink this back down and I'll show you kind of essentially what I started with as far as this initial chart. I wanted to create a spark line and that is specifically a win-loss spark line in Power BI. Now this visual and chart here initially looked like this. So I'm going to go ahead and reset some settings. Let's uh, get this back to the initial result. So that's essentially what the chart had that I wanted to create a win-loss binary of. Now a win-loss chart basically just shows above or below a threshold if a goal has been met or not. In this case, I have positive and negative numbers of month over month variances. And I found a trick to create a chart that allows me to do that. If I take the range and set that at minus one and a maximum of one, Considering that these are dollar values, all I have to do is scoot this up. There we go. I can adjust that and move these up to adjust for the space as well. Here we go. So this essentially creates that kind of sparkling type effect where we have a binary above or below a threshold. And the nice part about adjusting the axis here is I'm also able to get the tooltip initial values into this. Now, one thing that I did do as part of a bit of cleanup is I also turned the actual title of the axis off as well. That was something that was over on the right and initially would look something a little bit closer to that. But I wanted the um, axis labeling down here. There we go. Yes, this wanted to be turned off as well because I didn't really need this to show the scale of a dollar to minus one dollar. So I colored that as a white value, which allowed me to create approximately the effect of a spark win loss column using the data and still allowing me to maintain that basic tooltip. So very simple Im implementation with a minus one and one able to bring to be brought into this. Now, similarly, you can do that with a percentage as well. Even if you have percentage values instead of actual dollar values, same principle can apply. Now we're going to come over to here, look at the axis. There we go. And we can see that as long as I set that to a percentage that is low enough and high enough to 
account for whatever the min and max of any of these numbers would be, it still basically cuts the bars off and creates that similar effect that I want to for that kind of win loss spark line. And as I mentioned, this was something I did record a few weeks ago. So this is the public version of what I've done, but you guys get the sneak peek of one that is up and coming. So that is actually going to be over here. There we are. So again, I wanted to figure out actually how to incorporate the win loss spark column directly into the table itself. So the one that we have over here on the left is the visualization that we have of a matrix table with a spark line over there. Now notice the spark line, if we get rid of this, there we go. So what I've actually done is I created a custom measure here that does a check. If month over month sales is greater than or equal to zero, give it a positive one, otherwise give it a negative one. Now watch what happens. I can either come up to format your visual, I can go to cell elements, and actually, sorry, let's see. I, 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 that's right, you can't actually add a sparkline from here, but if you come back to add data, you can come down to any of these. Now you can select add sparkline. Now the beauty of this is I can actually change the y-axis metric it doesn't have to be what's in the table already. I can actually point this to anything else in my model. So if I look for month over month spark, put that into there, put that on by let's say month and year. There we are, click create. It puts it in and now it starts as a spark line, but as we've seen, we can come to format for the visual, we can go to spark lines, and then we can change it from line to a column. There we go, and change the data color to blue make it a bit more neutral. And now we get that win loss spark column that shows just basically any time per month period, whenever that has been above or below in this situation here. So very nicely organized by that. Now, rename that, maybe make that a bit uh, shorter. So I'll just say M O M spark column, actually win loss spark column. There we go. Excellent. Okay. So one implementation that we've seen now, I will say that a downside of this is the fact that, as you can see, uh, there's no way to color the individual colors individually. Unfortunately, that's a limitation of the Spark line built into Power BI. I would love the ability to actually do conditional formatting per any of these columns or periods for the win loss, but that's just a feature limitation as of today. But one consideration to have. Now, another implementation to this going down vertically rather than horizontally is similarly, you can apply that kind of logic to create the binary two sized uh, either negative or positive bars that are showing up here on a visual by applying that similar axis logic. So coming over to month over month sales, conditional formatting and data bars, as long as you have minus one and one, that allows you, let's go ahead and I'll just clear this back to lowest and highest so you can see the difference. There's the initial variance, but having that limitation on the axis range allows you to create it here and if you and if you wanted to you can also split them so we're going to come over to win loss table split what i did is i actually created a second version of the measure because the one downside is if i applied conditional formatting to this column right here the month, month over month sales as an example that will inherit if i put it in twice so let me sh let me provide the scenario of what was broken so i'm going to attempt to do some conditional formatting. I'm going to put data bars in here. I will say custom minus one and one. I want to show the bar only. Give it some nice colors. Select OK. Beautiful. But now I also want to show next to it the actual number. So the problem is the same measure inherits the conditional formatting as many times as it's used. So my solution to that, go back, go back back. There we go. Oh, one more. Perfect. So I created a month or month sales bar calculation, which simply just points back to the original calc. But this allows me to have two measures in here with two different names based on the same data, and I can individually format them. So I can have my KPI column here, and I can also have my initial value next to it. So I can split the two of them. Now I will say one downside is that data bars cannot show at the top level of a hierarchy. So if you have situations like this, where, there you go. So if you actually had a hierarchy like that, unfortunately you can't have the bar be on the top level. So the numbers have to show 
So I'd say this is more applicable, generally speaking, if you're using a flat table rather than a hierarchical table as well. But it gives you a few different options. You've seen how to basically create a column, uh, win loss spark. You've seen how to do it split or combine in a table vertically with that same type of a logic. Or you've also seen how to create a custom measure that also allows you to bring this in in a spark line. So hopefully you've had some good takeaways from this. You've seen many different ways to see how to implement a win loss logic spark line column or bar. And we've also seen some hopefully some ways that you can incorporate some additional insights into some of your reports going forward. Now the remaining content will be the non-exclusive stuff and the, the standard parts of my presentation, but hopefully you enjoyed some of that exclusive content that you guys get a sneak preview of. So this is something that has been, uh, it's one of the few actual topics that has been in my, in my demo since day one from back in the day used to be called unlocking new visualizations and features. Uh, with a lot of these techniques that are kind of interesting workarounds or hidden features, I do hope that someday they don't have to be hidden. They don't have to be a workaround. I still like to show them because people might not necessarily know that they exist, but my goal with a lot of this stuff is to provide feedback to Microsoft to make it easier so people don't have to watch a YouTube channel to realize this is a feature that the, the act of self-discovery when exploring reports will lead to this. So the feature itself is the fact that we have conditional formatting, uh, little KPI um, circles that are on the line chart. Now, the line chart natively does not support this. If I actually was to select it, and as an example, come over to any of the settings in here, there's no option for conditional formatting here. If I go to the format painter and look at data colors, same thing. Normally, if you actually had access to conditional formatting, you would see a little thing here with you know, f of x written there to click it, that would then take you to conditional formatting that will let you customize it. Obviously, we don't have an f of x icon there. Um, for those of you wondering what that would normally look like, I'm referring to one of these. That button, typically when you can color uh, conditionally format or provide some rules or logic to the color, you would see a symbol here, and that is what we do not have in this setting. Now, this was a happy accident. I stumbled upon this like five years ago. Uh, I was originally starting with a column chart, and the thing that we do have over here, we do have an f of x symbol that lets us apply some conditional formatting into here. Let me go ahead and back out of that. Uh, we can see in here it's less important with the logic because I just have some uh, KPI colors for the standard red, yellow, and green that are into there that just color the bars based on what percentage it is, the uh, bottom, middle, and top. And the bars, when you change the visual from a column to a line chart, so let me actually back out of this a couple times. There we go. It, it gets inherited. So it actually migrates that over. Um, now, this is one of those things where my first thought is, okay, cool. Is this a bug or a feature? That sometimes is a hard question to answer with certain things you come across in Power BI. Uh, but as soon as I discovered this, I emailed Microsoft. and like, hey, I found something that I would hope you don't patch, but I want you to be aware that this is a thing. Can I expect this to disappear in... A couple of months in a patch and they they assured me that you know they they're not going to actually make this more visible in terms of adding that f of x symbol uh to the actual line chart itself but because people have implemented this as a feature in reports they're not going to get rid of it so it's a safe thing to to implement and that's what i do with any of these tricks or, or like workarounds that i do uh, in reporting is i will not present anything to you that is not something that can be used in production so i i'm not going to give you half-baked solutions or things that basically will break or have too many issues there occasionally there might be one or two feature limitations to it but i won't deliver it to you anything that is going to be at risk to breaking down the road to your client i want these to be things that i teach you that can actually be used in reports so it's just a nice way to upgrade the default line chart and gives you the option to you know to get little bands that will show up into here and help to kind of further break out your data by whatever things you might be looking for. And uh, other things that I've done as well, like there are some more advanced tricks where I won't get into it on this one, but I do like to uh, do want to mention that you can actually use a measure to color the actual colors themselves, not as a specific color here, but you actually can write a measure to create a transparent color as well. Like there's, there's, an, there's a way to provide it a hex color that essentially it, doesn't understand. And the result of that, if you actually have a measure returning a series of hex colors, is it just returns transparent because it doesn't actually know how to render it. So when you do that, the output, as kind of as a feature mentioned, is you can actually have just certain dots show up, but overall you can actually like scrub the rest of them. So maybe I just want like these 
And based on whatever logic it is, there's only three or four dots that I actually want to show up onto the, the page, you know, using a bit more advanced logic. Um, and I'm going to build it into my demos at some point. Uh, you can actually make all of the other ones, except for certain ones based on criteria, disappear. So uh, some clever use, use cases for that. Uh, and we'll actually have a demo later that shows that. But from a very basic perspective, it's kind of a, it's not something that's intuitive. Most people would not think, oh, to get these, I have to start on a different visual. But it does show you at least a multi-step process that results in something that is at least stable. The downside, though, as a limitation is I can't choose the symbol. So I can't change these to a triangle or a square or anything else. And I can't choose the size. They are limited in that. The only thing configurable is the, the colors themselves. This one will actually be a few step process, uh, but it's one of the, the ones that I'm more proud of recently that I, that I built out in, in Power BI. Uh, since I, I released the video on this, I have seen a couple other people who have posted links that have, have done similar ones. But what I ended up building last fall is a selection for an analytics line that we see here at the top. You might notice that as I'm selecting this, I can actually choose my analytics line. I can have it be the average of my data, the median, uh, in this case, the percentile as well. So various different things that allow me to choose the analytics line. And then the bar itself actually changes colors between the two of these. Like, um, And as I configure this around, you will see that anything above the line is colored green. Anything below the line is colored gray. So it helps to call out the bars that have popped out past the line to, yeah, th thank you, uh, to be able to do that. So. Uh, this one will uh, I will take some time and, and spend to go through because there are a few things. But with a lot of my videos, what I like to do is I start with an idea and then I do a video on it. And then I figure out a way to enhance it a bit more. And I do another video and I keep building it out. So uh, I'll eventually get to the conditional formatting here. But what I do want to start with is how did I build the slicer here at the top that lets me choose between these? Um, the ones that I picked, by the way, are typically what you can actually add to the analytics from the pane here. So if I close this. Um, there, let me do a more basic visual. Uh, let's do, here we go. I want to show you what the, the, the native analytic lines options are. Here we go. So just so you can see that. So normally, this is what you're given. The min, max, average, median, and percentile. So with all of those there, like that's essentially what I reproduced on my slicer. So that, that's the native ones. But when you do this, you have to pick one of these. You don't have a way to select between them. You just assign one of these lines built into it. So I wanted to have a selection that gave me that same freedom. And this, this came about because recently, Microsoft added a new feature to the analytics line where you can add a x-axis constant line or a y-axis constant line into here. And that's what I added into this. It's, uh, it allows you, normally, you could just say, let's say 10 million. Uh, uh, sure, there you go. So I could, I could do a static value into here, which just, you know, it displays the base value that I have. But instead of that, every time you see this little f of x symbol, uh, and I'll answer your question in a second, it allows me to use a measure instead. So what I've actually done, is there is a field value that I'm using, which is a measure, and we'll walk through. Um, we'll walk through that here in a minute. But you select the uh, whatever measure it is that has all the logic, and then that is what's giving me all of these fun things. So uh, we'll show the measure in just a second. I'm going to look at some of these questions. How do you set the label analytics line within your chart? Ah, great question. So that's an easy one, and I'll answer that. Uh, yeah, and like I, I by the end of this, you will see how I turn the the lower values gray. So the question is, is how do I set the label analytics line within my chart? I'll read out the question just because not everybody can see the question on the, the chat. So that is done. Where are we at? Analytics line data. Here we go. Yeah. So it's under the data label. So if I turn that off, there we go. Data label turns off. If I turn it back on, it has an option for data value, name, or both. So that when I select both, that's what gives that is what gives me both the name that I, the custom name that I get it plus the value in here, and the name is assigned up here at the top when you double click onto that. So um, I just called it analytics line because I can choose what analytics to put into there. But let's actually break down the measure a little bit. Um, this is I'd say intermediate DAX uh, just to, to show you, but a lot of the links that's been provided there. Uh, this is something that I've done a YouTube a few YouTube videos on, and I also have a blog files page that contains all of the PBX files for this. So if you actually want to go back later, see how this is done, 
I w there will be resources too. Uh, oh yeah, the new the new format panel has so many missing features right now because it's in preview. So I, I I've stopped using it. I've done two demos on it. There were two menu options that hadn't been added yet that Microsoft now has acknowledged the bug. So the, you know, there, there's a reason I don't demo with preview features typically. It's they're, they're usually half baked, and there have been a lot of issues with the new formatting pane. Um, so I, I am very specifically avoiding it. Uh, the the docs that I want to show you here, here we are. All right. So the logic isn't particularly complex. What I've done is I've created a switch true statement, and I'll break this down and show you some other measures. But let's just go through each thing at a time. I have in the here a selection pane for average, median, two types of percentiles, inclusive, exclusive, and a percentage of max. And in here, I have a switch statement. It's an if when that is check in conditions. Basically, is is my slice of selection. If I have selected average, it is doing an average X. And this part's important. So here, this is looking at the axis here. So it is whatever in, in my visual, in this case, because the, the measure does have to be built a bit to find the average of all the values being displayed in the visual, because it doesn't know that. When I add the average line in there, it does not have a context of what, what is on the axis, because it's just returning a single number for the visual itself with no reference to like how the visual has been configured. So the measure itself does need uh, to point to that basically the same granularity. So that's why they're all pointing to calendar month and year. So I'm doing an average of all of my calendar month and va year values for sales amount. And basically just rinse and repeat that logic down the list for median. It is the median X function over the uh, unique rows for, uh, for the month and year and down the list for the exclusive. Um, and actually that should be INC. There we go. Uh, for each of these other ones that is in here. And the one difference with these last three, you might notice that I also have a percentage selection because that's typically in this calculation where the K value is returned. And that is like the, what is the percentile that I'm wanting to return? So I'm gonna minimize my DAX measure for just a minute. And that is where this little slicer that has a couple formatting logics in there, not applicable because there's nothing, there's no reason to set a percentage number for your average or your median. But if I set select percentile, then it the title dynamically changes to say percentile adjustment. Same thing with if I select the other one, and then if I select percentage to max, the title changes to that. And then that's how I'm able to set those. So these are last three basically turn on the slicer to allow me to make those adjustments. And that is what you see represented in this one. So I will walk through the percentage selection in just a minute. Um, the last thing that I want to show, and then I'll check some questions here in just a second, is this analytics selection. So basically, I just have a disconnected table in my model that is this slicer. So let me show you the, the table to, to give you some context. That is this table here. And the actual table itself is just something I use the enter data button to add this, this custom table. I just added a bunch of rows with each of the names. Uh, yes, as I, as I mentioned, the, these will be available on my uh, website, on the blog files page attached to my YouTube videos. Um, so uh, all of these files are on a, in a master repository on my website for blog files. Um, and we just have in here one row for each with a sort column to make sure it's in the correct order. Uh, but that is the uh, all of the calculations that I've had. And I have one measure in here. I can bring that back up. As I mentioned, I'm basically declaring a variable for my analytics selection. And this is a pretty basic calculation right here. There we are. All it is is selected value. Basically, if, if I have a selection made, it just returns the selection. So it's returning the word average, median, and that's how that check is happening in here. There we go. To determine whether or not that slicer is you know, selecting any of these values into there. Um, so from a base level, we have all of these ones. So um, let me double check to see if there is, there we go. Is this a visual a good time? The calculation groups could be used. Uh, potentially, the, the, the thing that's trickier about this is you're not changing the data necessarily in here. You are changing the slicer selection. And you could also have a calculation group um, doing that as well. Uh, that also predisposes that people are using tabular editor and stuff like that. I usually use calculation groups more for dynamic formatting and other stuff that that is a bit more complex to to actually funnel the data that is going into a column but it's kind of a both scenario like there's there might be a way to do this with the calculation group but 
I would I think it would require a few more steps. Um, either way, the logic is about the same. It just depends on where you're ho um, hosting it. So, um, all right. Uh, okay. So what I'm going to continue to do then, the last part that I want to mention into here, analytics line, I want to mention the percentage selection. So I made this, which is this thing here. This was made using modeling. That's right. New parameter. It is using the new parameter function. It's a what if scenario. So I went into here. And I basically provided a decimal number because percentages come as decimals. So it was between zero and one with an increment of 0.01. So like 1% increments. And your default is whatever default you might want to be. It could be like 0.5. So nice and even. Um, yeah, like uh, in theory, you could do that too. I mean, there's a lot of ways to do disconnected switches. Calculation groups are actually a great way to switch between measures. That's a pretty common scenario where you you have a calc group and a slicer that lets you switch, switch from actuals, budget, and forecast. There's uh, three or four live streams that I have on my YouTube channel that actually uh, talk about calc groups and some really cool ways to use those that I would recommend you check out later if you're interested in those. Um, but that's how I built this percentage table here. It, it creates a DAX calculated table. As you can see, there's a generate series there. The oddity that I always found, and I want to just mention this um, as well, is I I'm not going to, to 1. I'm going to 1.01. .01. Here's the reason. Annoyingly, if I go from between zero to one in a generate series, it doesn't let me actually go to 100%. It stops at 99. If you actually want the sli slicer to make it all the way to 100, it has to be 101%. I've been lazy and not actually asked Microsoft why that is the case, but that's what I found out. So now I can go to 100%. It, to me, if I'm going to tell between zero and one, I want to be able to go to the top, to the last value that I've assigned to it. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be n minus one. It should be n. But, you know, it, it's a small thing that you should be aware of. So whatever number you put in as your max, it's going to be one increment, one of these increments less than whatever that value is. So small considerations as far as to how the slicer uh, function works. So that is what is basically allowing me to create that dynamic variable, because this has a measure in here. It's my percentage selection. There we go. That actually should be a zero point. And this just re simply returns whatever the single value selection is. So when it's at 50% here, it is returning 0.50. Um, and that last but not least, as I mentioned in my analytics line, that is what is being funneled in these sections right here. All of those are basically just that number. So that's allowing me to take the percentile and then dynamically change either of my two types of percentiles or my percentage of max that goes into here. So. Overall, I'm getting a very nice, cool analytics line and slicers to give a huge amount of variation for a client to be able to do lots of different comparisons and you know slice and dice their data in many different ways. So, uh, e exactly, yeah, like you don't just have to have a single uh, analytics line anymore. You can make it as dy dynamic as you need to. So, I was very happy that they added that constant line as an option. Um, and then the most recent add-on that I did, because this was a video I did back in October. Uh, is the inclusion of something on top of it, which is the two color thing. So another new feature that Microsoft released last year that I was very happy for is I'm actually using a stacked column chart. So this thing in here is actually two values, sales below selection, sales above selection. So it is actually a two value stacked chart. That's how I'm able to get the, the values to show up here. So um, if you hover over this, oh yeah, I need to turn on my tooltip. There we go. There you are, you have the sales above selection, and you have a total value showing, which is lovely, uh, and you have a sales below selection. The reason I was able to finally do this as a stack chart is one primary reason. They, in the last six months, I think it was last fall, they added an option for total labels. This was not something built into a stack column chart before. So total labels both shows the label on the top of the, the visual, which is lovely, but it also gives that tooltip hover. So you get the total amount, and prior, this was kind of nice, but the annoyance was is obviously if anybody wanted a grand total, you would literally have to come and all right, 13.5 plus 8.7, and you'd have to do mental math to get the exact dollar value or number from this. Really convenient to be able to just turn this on and be able to get that total, regardless if you're stacking over the two. Um, I'll show you the measures in a second, but I have some logic calculating enough to determine basically whether or not that bar, the, the grand total, is above or below the line. and if it's below, it does some calculations to stack them together. So there's some good logic going on to do this. Let me now, as a final result of this, 
show you this one. I, I like this this demonstration because there's just so many different things that goes into it, uh, but it just makes for such a unique interactive uh, visualization. Uh, yeah, yeah, the conditional formatting is wonderful, and there's tons of cool modeling stuff you can do in Power BI to, to make a chart super dynamic. Uh, pretty basic, straightforward. We have Stales Amount, and then we have my analytics line here. Uh, the big thing that's important on this is unlike my analytics line, which I mentioned, this line here, think of this almost like a separate layer on top of my visual. It has no idea uh, really what's behind it. It does not know what's on my axis. It's just basically being loaded solidly into the visual as a single value, not understanding any other filter context. By the time I actually need to do a calculation to determine what this value is uh, at this level, I have to use the all function because what that does, normally, if I was to ask it to calculate my analytics amount, so if I just ran this by itself with no all filter, for every one of these columns where it's attempting to do that, it is only going to know the, um, the analytics value for that single month. Using the all filter here, what that does is it ignores all of this and essentially it's able to fetch the grand total value. So that's what the all function is doing in there. So that grand total value that's right here. Uh, this 8.79, that's essentially what's being retrieved. There we go, for this variable there. And then I just have a, a pretty standard if statement. So if my analytics amount, and actually I think what I can do, I'll just uh, use my, here we go, I'll use my highlighter. If this amount here, if that is less than my sales amount, essentially meaning that this is above it. So and in this case, if that condition is met where my sales amount has risen above my analytics amount, do a subtraction of the two of them. Basically, I want to know what's remaining. Like um, that's giving me this uh, this 1.9. That is this calculation here. Right here is what is being returned for this 1.9 or this 2.4. In this case, this 4 million that's below it, this condition has not been met. So the alternative condition, the, re the false condition is being returned. And since I don't have anything specified in my false portion of my if statement, that's just returning blank. The default for Power BI in an if statement if I have not specified it, is the exact same thing had I written this out. I just like to keep my thing short and sweet. So instead of actually writing blank as an alternative result, I simply, whoops, I simply uh, close my bracket. So it only is going to actually return an amount if my core uh, calculation of sales amount has gone and risen above it. At that point, all these green bars that you see, that's the value being returned for my top section. It's returning just the, you know, the amount that has been calculated that is above the line. And basically the flip is below it right here, that portion of the below the line, where if the analytics amount is less than the sales amount, so if, if this thing is less than that, it returns just the analytics amount. So basically that cutoff, it just returns the threshold of that solid bar. Otherwise, it returns the full sales amount, which that one that I'm highlighting here are any of those times where that bar uh, the, sorry, that column is below the analytics line. So that's how, that's how I'm able to stack them together and get that dynamic stacking with all of these. It's just two things that conditionally return a value if they ever fall above or below the line, and they stack together to create that nice little clean effect. And because this is a single visual, I'm not doing any custom layering, I'm able to get a clean grand total uh, because of that new feature for the total labels. So um, it, it was able to get an output that for me, it works perfectly. Uh, it works when I also full screen it. That's one issue that sometimes you can have if you actually stack visuals together um, and everything else. So next thing that we're going to talk about. So another thing that I've come across, um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, drill through should be fine in that other visual. There's no reason like you wouldn't. It, if, if you have something on categories in here where, you know, you want to be able to drill through to another page based off of the you know, that column in there is totally fine. It really just depends on your report setup, which can be very varied, but there's no reason you couldn't use, you shouldn't use drill through if you want to on a visual like this. The one that I want to mention here as the next feature that we're going to talk about, uh, notice the colors that I have on this visual here. It goes from black with its lighter colors to white as it gets to a certain darker shade. I was actually inspired to do this based off of uh, uh, some work that I've been doing with um, InfraRiver um, more recently, and I've been helping them develop and test out their, uh, and do a lot of videos for, for, it's a new custom visual that, that I don't need to get into, but in the process of that, excuse me, they had a conditional uh, formatting setting for background colors that also include included an option for auto font colors, and like, oh, that's 
that's a nifty trick. And that actually answers a solution to a problem that I've often experienced in Power BI. So my issue, let me go ahead and delete this and you, you know, so you can see the problem. Uh, sales, yes, that is the one that I want to get rid of. I'm going to remove my font color. So that's the problem. If you use colors that are too dark in a background color variant, gradient, you end up with, you know, situations like this, where it's kind of hard to, to read the values. And, you know, it's, you're, you're sitting there squinting at the monitor. And all right, so solution number one. Solution number one that we can do, we can do, we can change the colors to be lighter. So, okay, uh, that does kind of work. But the problem with this is, is as you lighten the colors, the gradient becomes less. So then the contrast between the two is also lessened. Uh, so like, yes, you can read the, the text a little bit better, but it's not as, you know, to me, the, the, there's not as much of a stark or identifiable contrast between the light and the dark. So I do like the darker colors because it really draws your eyes to those values that are more important more easily. So, all right, well then, how do we actually update the font color as well? So I, I'll show you the logic for that. And it's, it's not particularly complicated. And it also shows you that you can layer your conditional formatting in a native visual. I'll come back to my sales. I'm going to go to font color. Pretty simple. So I have just set up a couple of rules where I have looked based off of like the min and max percentage, uh, the zero to 25. I've chose to color black and from 25 to 100 um, white. So basically it's, you know, whatever the highest percentage is versus the lowest. And I'll, sometimes this takes a little bit of tweaking. Like I, I spent a couple of times to, you know, I first started like, all right, well, what about zero to 50 for black? Let's try that. And, you know, you know, tweaking out if it if it's too much. Let's. Uh, I, I want to break it. So give me one sec. See, so let's do like. Yeah, let's actually do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Seventy-five. There we go. Yeah. So in this case, like, okay. Well, at seventy-five percent, only these are getting colored white and. Maybe this color is dark enough that I do want it to switch there. So it really is just a matter of tweaking where your cutoff is. What is that percentage? Is it going to be 80, 75? And a lot of times that is just playing with your data and, and just seeing where is the good threshold that is approximately where I want to cut off on. And there, there's no right answer to this. Like that, a lot of it depends on you know your data. Sometimes it might take giant leaps. Like you might have a value that is at the 50 percentile and then and then uh, percentage, and the next one is like 80 percent. So it really is just a matter of opening it up. Um, because of this, I do wish there was a way to click update. I would love to come into here and set it and have a button for update so I can keep this window open so I could just easily tweak the number. So you do have to close and reopen the window every time, but eventually you find it like, all right, well, let's try you know, 25 and then you know, just making sure your logic is set up. And at that point, oh yeah, there's, there's the cutoff that seems to be at the appropriate level that works for me. Um, but it, it's really fun uh, to be able to do this and uh, yeah, I think, again, it, it has now unlocked kind of a both and for me. I can make my color as dark as I possibly want, and then the font switches when it needs to. So it uh, it allows for a kind of a best of both worlds. Easy to set up is a nice example of layering for conditional formatting. And, and again, I was inspired by like a, another custom visual that did it automatically. And anytime I see a custom visual doing something, I try to figure out, all right, can I do it natively in Power BI without having to download something else? And this was a nice solution for that. Uh, similar is the uh, thing that you see with the bars, uh, the kind of, you know, the year over year sales, the, th the issue that you could have before is that a, the, uh, if I get rid of the font color, there we go, same problem, nearly impossible to read. Like, all right, so the, the one option is you can make the bars very light or kind of go with a neutral. Now this one's a little trickier because here's examples where the font isn't just over the bar, it is also over the background as well. So your, your two avenues for this is you make the bars lighter, it solves everything. You have the bars light enough that black text still shows up against it, or you do a hybrid color. I chose kind of a in-between gray that shows both on a dark color and a white background. So like that's the in-between on this one. And if I sales, check the font color on this as well. Um, and I honestly probably don't even need the two shades. I try to do two shades of gray, depending on how much it's passed over. But really, you probably honestly only need uh, this one. There you go, 100. Yeah. And uh, it, it pops up on both uh, avenues. But same kind of concept. But instead of choosing white, I am choosing an in-between gray color that 
that can exist in both uh, both worlds there. But it's a it's something that I honestly I'm surprised I hadn't thought of for years and only until eight months ago, considering how long conditional formatting has been in Power BI. Uh, but it's a fairly straightforward calculation. Uh, the percentage on year year over year sales, it's just how much you know versus prior year. It's it's um, current year minus minus prior year divided by prior year. Uh, pretty standard year over year calculation. Um, if you're that's more uh, or less related to the uh, focus of this one. Uh, but if you want to explore all of those calculations, uh, the PBX file, I'll encourage you to go like uh, grab that from my site and download that later. All the measures are exposed, and you you can play with it as at your leisure. Last kind of thing to show you a bit of magic with button design. Uh, so this was a client scenario where they wanted a radio toggle for their buttons. And I'm going to, you know, you can basically toggle it to show you that, but you can see that there's like a little slider where I can slide these back and forth. You know, three little states. And this was something that I first considered, can I do a custom image and anything else like that? Uh, and I ended up being able to do this entirely with native buttons. This is something that was built completely out of native features with not much else going on to it, but I just wanted to walk you through the way to build this out um, so you can kind of see that a little bit. So uh, number one thing that's important in here is the fact that you have an option for buttons among many other configurations um, for rounded edges. So regular buttons are square. If you add a certain number of a number of pixels into here for a rounded edge, you get more of that pill shape that you might be looking for uh, to be able to have the little slider that moves back and forth across it. Uh, also some states that are also capturing this. So this button here has the shape that we've already discussed. Um, similarly, I basically have three states that, that can be declared for button for those of you who've used them. You have your default, which is static on the page. You have a hover. That is what it looks like when you hover over it. So I chose middle and a neutral gray color, and then we have on press, which is over on the left. So all three of these creates kind of that illusion of you know sliding left and right to trigger something. And the thing that I had fun with is the fact that my text in here, we have a fancy uh, handy dandy little thing in our uh, repository where you hold the Windows key and you press colon. Uh, there we go. You get an emoji keyboard that pops up. Beautiful feature of Windows 10. Uh, I learned about this a few years ago, and it was one of those just like mind blown. This is great. I used to have to go to um, you know Google and basically look up emojis. I did not realize there was a built-in pop-up for this, but if I search for something like circle, I get a circle that shows up. So I actually use an emoji circle because it has a couple of other things in here. Uh, it has the black line that's around it, so it's it's formatted a little bit nicer than just a simple black dot, which I could have used as well as an ASCII dot. Uh, this one I specifically chose to do. Um, I will say that there is a consideration. The emoji library between operating systems is a little bit different. So they all share a common library of symbols like this. There is a white circle emoji for Apple, Android, Windows, Linux, and so on. It might look a little bit different, like Windows, has thick borders around everything. Um, you know, exactly. I mean, it does help it to stand out. But uh, the the one on Android, it might it might be a circle without a um, without a line around it. The Apple one might have a little bit of shading on it. So the uh, it is the Windows key and colon. So the I mean equivalent of this. I will just show it up on my notepad. Uh, this there. That's the uh, shortcut for that. You also could do an image potentially as well. Um, if you wanted to do an icon, that is something you can consider doing. But for this, I did the text. My only thing that I'm just mentioning as the caveat is when you load this, just be aware of the operating systems that people are loading this on because it will change slightly how that emoji looks depending on the OS that they're uh, running. So notice that my default state has a right horizontal alignment. On hover is centered. So that's how I'm getting it in the middle. And then on press is over on the left when I click it. So that's how I'm able to get that sliding because I'm, choose, I'm changing the alignment with each one. So it's a really nice way to just choose the alignment and it automatically moves it over for you so between those two. So like the vertical, the vertical and horizontal alignment gives you a lot of flexibility to really customize many different looks and feels with the buttons. They've added so many features recently, like the, the additional shapes, shadows and glows are new, also is the rotation. So there's, I've seen so many cool videos in the last six months come out on 
super unique ways to design buttons and uh, people who are more of a are artist and designer than even I am who, who are coming up with really cool stuff like former web designers and, and uh, I would say like website artists have come up with some really cool uh, unique button designs. Um, but this is just kind of a basic one that I think just shows you how uniquely a button can look outside of just being a square box with a word to say click me. Like you can really do a lot of cool aesthetic designs and changes. And the, the final effect that you get is that toggle here. Um, and what I am doing, by the way, just as this last wrap up here, and I'll um, want to mention my selection pane, observe a couple of things. So as I switch between these two, notice that I have actually two buttons on my page. I have an area button, which is hidden, and a column button, which is visible. And as I actually toggle between these two, the visibility changes. So not only does my chart on my page change, the other thing that changes is I'm actually toggling between two buttons. If I show both of these at the same time, there are technically two buttons that are stacked on top of each other. So that's how I'm able to get the effect where the default switches from right to left. I'm hoping someday that they add a, a fourth state somehow into the buttons where, and I'm trying to describe like what I would like to see someday, I would love a fourth identifiable state where it could be default, hover press, and then bookmark activated state. Because I believe there is a way to identify if the, if the bookmark is signed to this button is active or not on the page. And if it is, I want to configure a fourth state because uh, you know, that, that button's been activated. So now this is what I want it to look like now that the bookmark assigned to it has been toggled. But because that fourth state does not exist today, you do have to have kind of two versions of the button that's basically like inactive and active to switch visibility between. So there's a little bit of extra work there, but you just have to kind of stack them on top of each other and then toggle the visibility between the two. Uh, the one thing that um, really helps with this uh, is when you turn on Snap to Grid. So with Snap to Grid, I can resize a button and then really easily, if I get a new button, because it's snapping uh, both in size and position, I can instantly pixel perfect that button to snap on top of a of something else. So I don't have to go to the general settings and adjust the pixels. It's just, it snaps exactly to the same size. So that's how I'm able to get them to stack on top of each other so easily. Uh, maybe actually better if I do it with this one. There we go. That's how I'm able to get them to stack perfectly, really quickly is using the snap to grid option um, without having to muck around with, um, previously it would be the settings that I would have to normally adjust. I would come into here. I would change the positions, the width, the height, and I'd have to you know, to make it pixel perfect from this area. So Snap to Grid is a wonderful, quick and easy solution. Um, that's also how I typically space my objects onto the page. Like this border, that's one snap from each other. I, it's a one snap spacing, which is eight pixels, by the way. Every snap, height and width, should have been the other way, height and width, um, it's eight pixels that it moves. Every time you move something, every time you read something, it is eight pixels at a time when it snaps.